Thank you, Dana, and thanks to all of you for coming. I just turned around and said to my colleague, Charlotte, this isn't our usual audience. Um, and I'm, that pleases me a lot, to see <laughs> people from different places in the community and campus. Um, and because of that, I'm going to tell you this. Um, when we in the English department have these readings, we compose these introductions that my colleague Toby here in the front row describes as term papers. <laughs> so, here's my term paper. Last spring, a woman in her early 20s in Fayette County in southwestern Pennsylvania said to me, you know why the gas companies bring all their own workers in from out of state? Because no one around here can pass the drug test. <laughs> That's not true, of course. And she said it <coughs> laughing like it was a joke. But it says something about that part of Pennsylvania near where I grew up. What there is to do for work there after farms fail and coal mines and steel mills and VW plants close. What there is to do for fun and how easy it is to take a dim view of your own community. Last year, I set out to read every literary work I could find that deals with shale gas development. A novel, a couple of collections of poems, several memoirs, and more than a few works of nonfiction. And I am here to tell you that The End of Country by Seamus McGraw, the first book-length nonfiction study of life above the Marcellus Shale, was my favorite. At its heart, and it is a very large heart, this book is about going home, which is my favorite kind of story, as long as it's told honestly. An award-winning journalist fallen on hard times along with the national economy and print news industry, McGraw must reckon with the promise of fracked gas royalties from the farm where he grew up. And he tells the truth. Not just truths about that place and its people, his neighbors, family, and his own troubled past. But this offer from Chesapeake means that despite raging ambivalence, he must figure out where he stands in the national energy debate. King Cole killed McGraw's great-grandfather more than a century ago, and he carries the scar that mining and coal production left on the land and psyche of many Pennsylvanians. He knows gas is a bridge to nowhere if we can't find alternatives. He cares about the earth and worries about making money without working. No one knows all the risks and all the benefits that come from fracking. But what's best for his home place? I love how McGraw narrates northern rural Pennsylvania. Small dairy farms failed because the price of gas and diesel and fertilizer, all made from oil, rose uncontrollably while milk prices stayed flat. Rural, rural boys with few options enlist in oil-driven wars or stick around and get stoned, which is why the promise of gas jobs is so seductive, never mind the drug test. McGraw claims this book is not about energy, despite his detailed descriptions of the history and technology of gas drilling, including Penn State's role in all that. Welcome, Terry Engelder. <laughs> this writer can make a frack job sound fascinating. But as he said in many interviews, this book is mostly about people the character of rural people. The folks he profiles near Dimmick in Susquehanna County are unforgettable, wise, subversive, inventive, and principled in the face of Cabot oil and gas, and also in the face of one another. Last month, the Department of Environmental Protection released details on 248 cases 
of natural gas operators damaging private water supplies in our state. Twenty of those cases occurred in Dimmock around the time the events in this book took place. Long after the news and lawsuits are forgotten, the end of country and its characters, not least among them McGraw and his distinctive voice, will remain. Because this book attempts to figure out what really happened there and what continues to happen in communities north and west and south of us. This book beautifully demonstrates why we need more than accurate information. If we are to understand what's happening, we need literature and visual representations like the photographs upstairs. We need theater as well as the geoscience and politics that have produced and now scramble to control our shale gas boom. I'm so glad this book exists. And I can't wait for McGraw's next one, due out in the spring. It's called Betting the Farm on a Drought, Stories from the Front Lines of Climate Change. Please join me in welcoming Seamus McGraw back to Penn State. <laughs> How many of you have seen me speak before? Good, I don't have to come up with any new jokes. <laughs> um, let me start uh, real quickly by um, answering the question that I know is first and foremost on everybody's mind. And that's the, the answer is, yes, I do know I'm dressed like a member of a Village People tribute band. <laughs> um, or like Michael Flatley from Lord of the Dance. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. And the reason is that I came out here on my bike, my, my, my trial. And I do that pretty much for all of these talks, um, this and the next one, um, for a couple of reasons. One, if you've read the book, you know that I'm in the throes of a truly epic midlife crisis and have been since I was about 26. Um, <laughs> The other reason is I get to indulge that midlife crisis at 50 miles an hour, or at 100 miles an hour, and 50 miles per gallon. And one of the things that when we're having the discussions about this subject, we don't talk enough about, is the role that conservation plays. It's a, a very, very important role in this. But I'll tell you guys a quick story, because that's all I do. I'm a storyteller. Um, I, I often open, as you can tell, often open the talk with that bit. Um, and I did it at um, American University, where they had made the book uh, In the Country Required Reading. And I added a little bit to it there, because I think it's important to what we're discussing tonight. Um, I said, there is yet another reason why I'm channeling my inner Michael Flatley tonight. This was a speech to about a thousand incoming persons. I said, there's another reason I'm channeling my inner Michael Flatley tonight, and I said, it's because of what I believe to be my favorite review ever of the end of country. And it wasn't one that appeared in a newspaper, in a magazine, or even on an online site. It was a tweet. And it was a tweet from one of the students who was in that room that night, who had been forced to read the book and who tweeted, and I quote, Seamus McGraw is a douche ward and should never have written a book. <laughs> and I said, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I am the lord of the douche. <laughs> but there was a deeper point to that. And the deeper point to that was that when I was, um, for that brief year when I was allowed to remain at Wilkes, what's now Wilkes University, if I was dragooned into reading a book that I really hated or that I really loved, six guys on a bar in South Main Street knew about it. We don't live in that world. We live in a world where there is absolutely no wall whatsoever between the writer and the reader. And a book 
When I was a kid, a book was almost an artifact. It was the end of a conversation. It isn't anymore. It's just the beginning of a conversation. It's the beginning of an ongoing conversation. Any of you guys who were in the class earlier today that, that I was sitting in on, I do this at every talk. My home phone number is 570-588-6000. My cell phone number is 570-236-4050. My email is SeamusM at PTD.net. I am on Facebook a lot more often than my wife would like me to be. I'm on Twitter about the same amount of time. Let's keep the conversation going. It's not just here and now, it's an ongoing conversation. I learn every time I, I have contact, you know, and it, it keeps going. About tonight, let me start by kind of telling you where I stand. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to ask a question, and Terry is excluded from answering this question. What is fracking? What is it? Can anybody tell me? Go ahead. Um, I think it's extracting natural gas from kind of hard to reach crevices deep in the ground using um, like a high powered jet of water and chemicals. That does what? What does it do? It forces the um, gas up and out through this thing. Yeah, basically. When I ask that question, I usually get somebody who's really knowledgeable who will tell me that what it is is you drill down a mile or so into the earth, you drill out a mile or so into the earth, you turn around and you blast down a mixture of sand, chemicals, and water at thousands and thousands of pounds per, uh, per square inch of pressure, and you fracture the rock and release the gas. And I'll say, you know what, that's almost, that's almost right. It's 99.9% .9 right. But you're not fracturing. The rock. What you're doing is exploiting existing fractures in the rock. And I argue that what's happening a mile and a half below the surface is, in a lot of ways, a mirror image of what's happening on the surface in this issue. That you have these wounded, fractured communities that have been holding it together for generations in some cases, decades to be sure. And you have forces, quite frankly, on both sides of this issue, pouring phenomenal resources into these places, exploiting fractures that exist in this community, often for reasons that have very little to do with the subject at hand. In this, in this context, I want you to consider something. I don't want to know, at this moment, we'll talk later, where any of you stand on the issue of fire. But I will tell you something. I have found, doing probably 75 of these talks, <clears throat> that if I know where you stand, on the issue of fracking, I can tell with an alarming degree of accuracy where you stand on five or six or seven or eight other hot button issues in this culture. I probably know where you stand on the issue of same sex marriage. I probably know where you stand on the issue of guns. I probably know where you stand on the issue of abortion. And you know what? To me, that's a goddamn tragedy. Because it means we're not evaluating this subject on its own value. We're looking at it from our tribal perspectives. And to that end, I want to share with you guys, if you'll indulge me, if you say no, and I'll give you the, the chance to say no, if you say no, I, I won't. But I'd like to read a little bit from my new book that kind of touches on this a little bit. Is that all right with you guys? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. 
It was a bitterly cold November evening in one of those off the beaten track towns with cobblestone streets, one of those places where the main street is lined with gingerbread houses and 21st century coffee shops and 19th century brick storefronts where you feel like you could almost warm yourself in the glow from the windows. I'd been invited to speak about my own moral ambivalence about the politically charged subject of fracking and climate change at a local bookstore, a dusty, out-of-the-way place with groaning, wide, blank floors, worn smooth by generations of voracious readers back in the days when there still was such a thing. The kind of place where even the light from the street seemed to stop and browse as it passed the stagnant bookshelves on its way to the back of the bookstore, and I jumped at the opportunity. I'd given a version of that talk a few times before, and it was always controversial. There were always a few in the audience who let me know in no uncertain terms that they believed the whole idea of global warming was a hoax perpetrated by goatskin drum-beating extremists bent on destroying the free enterprise system. They saw it as a thinly veiled plot to bring America's workers under the sway of a rapacious government that was always only barely containing its socialistic lust for other people's property. <clears throat> And there were always a couple of people who saw any concession to the idea that we might have to feel our way slowly out of our carbon addiction as an utter capitulation to the creeping corporate conspiracy hatched by the Koch brothers, Halliburton, Monsanto, Monsanto and the Scape Foundation to foul our water with petrochemicals, taint our food with GMOs in order to turn us into zombie slaves willing to watch mutely as they polluted our environment, left us destitute and came to my house to snatch my eight-year-old son and work of the death in the 21st century, the 21st century version of the same coal breaker my grandfather escaped from a century ago. Now I'm usually pretty light on my feet when it comes to these talks. I can generally navigate between these two poles and I'm usually able to find enough shared interests on both sides to show that at least a partial consensus is possible, even if only remotely. I had no reason to doubt that I'd be able to do it there too. After all, the folks in that town clearly understood the stakes, I was sure. Just eight weeks earlier, that bookstore in that little town had been in the crosshairs of a major destructive natural phenomenon, a 500-year storm, the second such storm to rape the region in a generation. And it was only a pale shadow of the megastorm, Sandy, that would slam into the East Coast a year later as the second deadliest and costliest storm to hit the country in modern times. That time, the bullseye missed my hosts in their town. Their neighbors upriver were not so lucky. What started out as Hurricane Irene and became the costliest Category 1 storm in United States history caused more than $15.8 billion in damage, almost all of it, in a narrow path that stretched from the Susquehanna River Basin in central Pennsylvania to the eastern banks of the Hudson in upstate New York and into western Vermont. Now, to be sure, there was disagreement in the scientific community about how much the changing climate, rising ocean temperatures, and rising sea levels added to the fury of the storm. But among the scientists and analysts I had spoken to, there was little doubt that if Irene was not a smoking gun that demonstrated clearly that our addiction to fossil fuels had already set us well on the road to disaster, it was, at the very least, a harbinger of things to come, a warning of what we might face if we failed to reduce the amount of carbon that we were pumping into the atmosphere at a great net pace. Certainly, I figured a close call like that would make this precious little river town fertile ground for a discussion about the wisdom of compromise. At least that's what I thought until about midway through my talk when a member of the audience stood up and in graphic detail related an incident so hard so extreme that it proved, at least in that person's mind, that those on the other side of the issue were so fundamentally evil that no compromise with them was possible, and that no sane person would even consider it. The incident, of course, never happened. If it had, it would have been the front, on the front page of every newspaper in the world. It would have been on an endless crawl against the across the bottom of every cable news network. It would have been on an earth-shaking international event on a par with the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico or the discovery of Pol Pot's killing fields in Cambodia. But I could look in this person's eyes and see that this person was not lying to me. 
The story was related with the same fervent, passionate faith with which a fundamentalist Christian might recount the story of Noah's flood, or an avowed Marxist might expound on the glories of a proletarian dictatorship. As far as this person was concerned, every word was gospel. Now, I'm not by nature a particularly confrontational person, and so rather than embarrass the person directly, I opted to ask a few probing questions. I made it to the third question, and when I saw a look of panic start to creep across this person's face, I actually felt a twinge of sympathy as the person slowly came to fear that the story didn't hold up under scrutiny, that the whole complex structure of this person's worldview, or at least as it related to this issue, was built on thin air. At that moment, the person stood up, marched to the door, spun around, glared at me, and sputtered before storming out, I am not going to argue with you, I am comfortable in my ignorance. <laughs> my first reaction, to borrow a phrase from my Australian wife, I was gobsmacked. My second reaction was that I vowed that one day soon I would launch a petition drive to have e pluribus unum removed from our money and replace it with, I am comfortable in my ignorance because that is who we have become. You've no doubt noticed that clumsily at times I have not told you which side of the issue this person was on. Nor have I told you precisely where this occurred. I haven't even told you the person's gender. There's a reason for that. Polls have indicated that on this issue, as on so many others, gender can sometimes be a predictor of position, so can geography. I haven't even detailed the horrific apocalyptic event the person referred to, and with good reason. Even our most fevered nightmares these days are factional. The fact of the matter is this person's actual position, forged in fear and fabricated into a stubborn dogma, is irrelevant. They could have been on either side. What that person personified is precisely what political writers and sociologists have filled volumes detailing in recent years, that how long-existing cultural fractures are being exploited by the most extreme voices on the right and the left, and how the cultural fissures they force open have spiderwebbed through the society, rendering us more divided than we've been at any time since perhaps the Civil War. The divisions have paralyzed or at least marginalized our institutions, government, academia, even industry, at the precise moment when we most need those institutions to help us collect the data and devise the strategies to deal with the maddeningly complex challenges we face. Those fractures are rough and jagged, and they are sometimes very, very deep. In the end of country, I kind of wander along some of those fractures. And I'm going to introduce you to um, a couple of folks who are um, not inclined to see things the same way in the beginning. Who are able to some degree to bridge the fractures between them. The first is Victoria, and I am very proud of something. And it's people on both sides of the issue have been very kind to end the country. Um, I've had people from both sides of the issue kind of supporting the book, which tells me that they've only read half of it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I'm very, I, when I sign this book, I usually sign it the same way. I sign it uh, the only thing that's black and white in this book are the letters on the page. But my book is signed. Um, and I'm very proud of this, okay, by two people. One is the person I'm about to introduce you to, okay, who has become, she calls herself a reluctant activist, a woman named Victoria Sweitzer up in, uh, up in, in um, who I think has fought a heroic fight on this issue. And I consider her a friend. I consider her a friend. The other is Professor Engel. 
a guy who is often called the godfather of the Marcellus, and a guy I also consider a good friend. And let me introduce you to Victoria. Like many newcomers to the country, Jim and Victoria had been enthralled by the ambient song of solitude, the gentle babbling of a tiny brook at the edge of their property, the insistent hum of a hundred thousand insects, the call and response of hawks and sparrows, the wind rustling through the ancient hemlocks, the call of an owl far off in the woods. It reminded Victoria of the night she had spent at her grandmother's place, lying on the grass with her siblings, watching the stars twinkling above her, and listening to the sounds of the wooden dark forest. But there are other sounds in the country, too, the harsh mechanical sounds of people trying to get by in a place where you have to fight the land itself for everything you have. It's the angry howl of a chainsaw chewing through downed trees so somebody can stock up enough firewood to keep the house warm for the winter, the bitter protest of a lumber truck or a rock truck or a milk truck engine breaking so that it can safely make it down some precipitous side road one, uh, one hill over, or the guttural growl of a tractor with a 30-year-old muffler hauling a spreader full of oozing manure down the road. That's the moment when newcomers learn for the first time what cow shit really smells like. And then one morning over coffee, they heard it, a sound that set their teeth on edge, rolling straight down the hill toward them from Ken Ely's place. It was a nightmare in the cool light of morning. It was every obnoxious industrial sound the region could offer, and then some, the shriek of the chainsaw, the coughing and sputtering of an engine and a backhoe well past its prime. Worse still, there was the bizarre animalistic shriek of steel on cold stone. It echoed through the trailer and through Jim and Victoria's skulls. Worst of all, there was the blasting. Fortunately, it wasn't an everyday occurrence, and it wasn't as if they could do anything about it anyway. The law said Ken had the right to blow up his rocks, and Ken was going to blow up his rocks, though the law also required that Ken hire someone to do the actual blasting, a condition to which he reluctantly submitted. submitted. For Jim and Victoria and their German shepherd, that meant there was nothing to be done but listen for the periodic sounding of the air horn, the warning that the blasting was about to begin, grab the nearest solid surface, and hang on. Her neighbors had advised her against challenging Ken directly. He wasn't the type to take the admonishment of strangers kindly, and she tried to take their advice. She really, she had. The problem was she was constitutionally incapable of stopping herself. Maybe it was her father's legacy. As a kid back in Falls, a little town along the Susquehanna River, right between the rugged hollows of the endless mountains and the burned-out coal fields of the Wyoming Valley, she had watched her old man with unabashed admiration as he took on the big boys, the local, county, and state government and big business, to block the construction of a power plant that he was convinced would further poison the already wounded <coughs> river. He's a tough little guy, she used to say, and she'd always been proud of him for winning that fight. And when she became a history teacher, she had chosen to teach a few miles south of Dimmick and Tunkhannock, partly so she could be close to the mountain she had come to love. She always tried to infuse her lessons with a little bit of the individual versus the corporate state complex message she had learned from her father. She had to admit that it had sometimes proven a little difficult to squeeze a morality tale about the zoologist Diane Fossey's brutal murder into a regular lesson plan. And she did raise a few eyebrows around the administration office when she got one of her classes to adopt, virtually of course, a mountain gorilla in Fossey's honor. Now the teacher in her couldn't resist the temptation to take Ken Ely to school. It didn't happen right away. Whenever she got a chance, she'd grab her dog and head off on a hike along the top of the ridge, and she'd peer over the chest-high stone wall that marked the boundary of Ken Ely's land, helping to catch sight of him. But Ken Ely was an elusive and wily man. In the first few months she lived there, she had seen him only once, and then from a distance when he came roaring through the woods on a rattletrap ATV decked out in camouflage. As she later put it, she could have sworn she heard banjo music. <laughs> For the longest time after that, she'd half try to catch him, stalking up to the rock wall whenever she suspected he might be at work there, but each time when she got there, he advanced. It was unnerving, she told him. In fact, she said, she often had the feeling as she and her dog walked along her side of the stone wall that someone or something, maybe a deer, maybe a bear, 
Maybe even one of those long gone catamounts that still turn up from time to time in the imagination of the local who was watching them. As it turned out, she was right. One day she caught sight of something moving through the woods, and then it emerged, hesitantly at first, a clownish blue tick coon hound with friendly, questioning eyes, grinning goofily and wagging its tail tentatively as it approached her, cocking its head, pleading, pleading to be petted. She had made contact with Kenny Lee's dog. It was only a matter of time before she'd faced the man himself. And then, one afternoon, a short time later, while Victoria and her dog were hiking along near the top of the ridge, there they were, Ken and his dog, not far from the stone hedge that marked the end of her land. This might be her only chance to make him understand. You know, you're killing the land, she blurted out as the coon hound slowly skulked away. <laughs> Ken remained silent. He just stood there, glaring at her, with what she would later come to learn was the patented Ken Ely scowl that most of his neighbors and all of his grandchildren had long since learned to ignore. She screwed up her courage and kept on talking. His rock quarrying was more than just an aggravation to his neighbors, she explained, though it was destroying the pastoral silence she had been fantasizing about since she was a child. It was an assault on the pristine beauty of the place. The way she saw it, his quarry was a cancer on the land, though even she grimaced when she used that phrase, thinking maybe it was just a bit over the top. Still, the school teacher in her couldn't pass up the opportunity to educate the quarryman, and if he took it badly, well, that was unfortunate, but he'd just have to get over it. Ken Ely, of course, saw things differently. The way he told it, <clears throat> it wasn't Victoria's bluntness that irked him in that first encounter as much as it was her attitude. She seemed typical of a breed of newcomer, people who act like they know the place because they can name the little villages that dot the highway, places so small you need a magnifying glass to find them on a map. They always seemed to be looking down their noses at people like him. But as hard as he had tried to ignore his new neighbor, there was something about her that had gotten under his skin. It wasn't just that she hadn't grown up in these hills and didn't understand what he and the others who did, who lived there did, that what a man does on his own land is his own business. It was that she did live here now, and somehow that made her think that she had a vote on what he did with his land, or at least the right to state her opinion, and that was what Ken couldn't abide. As he put it to me, she didn't seem to understand that this isn't some vacation spot, some pristine corner of the wild that could be pressed into the pages of a book like an old corsage. The land was all Ken and most of his neighbors had. In the past, people like Ken had taken from it whatever their abilities and the particular limitations of their own land would allow. Corn, milk, timber, stones, and if that wasn't enough, and it usually wasn't, they'd take a little more. But for most, the days when you could make a living farming the land and maybe timbering it a bit were over. The farms were largely gone. And that meant that you could either carve up the cadaver of the land and sell off small chunks to folks like Victoria, or you could carve out what you needed and measure it out in tons. Ken had chosen the latter. Still, he never took more than the land was willing, however grudgingly, to give. And the land was more resilient than people like Victoria realized. You could tear it up with plows and bury it under mountains of fertilizer. You could hack down its trees and blast out its rocks with dynamite. You could ship the shards of rock down to the valley where rich people would use them to put facades on their McMansions or build those little stone walls to evoke that fake country charm so prized these days. But the minute you stop plowing or digging or blasting, the land would start to come back. Sure, you could kill it if you were greedy or careless enough. You could dig too deep, take too many trees, poison the land or the water with fertilizer, but if you did that, you knew you'd have nothing left at all. The way Ken Ely saw it, the land he owned didn't owe him a fortune, it owed him a living, and not necessarily an easy one. 
In return for every dollar's worth of stone the land yielded, it was due a gallon of sweat plus a few pounds of aching muscle and a few feet of creaking bone. But if, in Ken's calculus, the land owed him next to nothing, he owed everything to the land. He owed it his hard work, his constant attention, and most of all, his respect. And it was on the question of respect that he and Victoria diverged. To him, people who only visit the country from time to time or who never visit it at all and only occasionally imagine it as a world wholly separate from their own, respect for the land often means leaving it untouched. To such people, it all boils down to one word, preservation. It's an admirable idea, one that has been embraced by some of the great heroes of American history and has led to the creation of Yosemite and Yellowstone National Parks, among other treasures. But to people like Ken, respect for the land means something else entirely. It means understanding in a visceral way that the land can be an ally, it can be an adversary, and sometimes it is both at the same time. But always, its fate and yours are linked. And so you push the land as hard as you can. And when you think it's just about ready to start pushing back, you let it rest. You move to the next quarry, the next stand of hardwoods, the next pasture, and if need be, you nurture it back to health. You seed, you plant, and what you harvest is up to you. Do that, and the land will always come back. That was Ken's guiding principle. There's a word for that, too conservation. It's stunning how often the words preservation and conservation are used interchangeably in casual conversation. It's especially striking when you realize how different their meanings actually are. Ken and his jury rigged backhoe were different, even if he didn't care about the land, and he did, passionately, though he was never one to show his passion publicly. Ken's little operation could never do that kind of damage. I understood that. We both knew the land as a resource and a refuge, a place that, as the old saying goes, had been rode hard and put away wet. I couldn't help but remember the old Groucho Marx line about Doris Day, I knew her before she was a virgin. That was Ken's relationship to the rocky ground, and it was, in many respects, mine, too. While Ken had wisely held his tongue during his first encounter with Victoria, he wasn't entirely silent. The way he wryly remembered it, it wasn't long afterwards that he got his chance to offer his rebuttal, and it consisted of simply standing his ground. He had finished prying and scraping and dragging out every loose rock he could find in that part of the quarry, and now it was time to bring in the big guns, enough dynamite placed just deep enough into the fractures in the rock to blast free a new load, and he called in some local guys to do the job. Ken watched as the contractors pulled back a safe distance and then listened for the air horn to sound. An instant later, the ground shook and a massive bone-rattling roar rolled up out of the ground and down toward the rusted trailer at the bottom of the hill like an invisible wave. The bark of a purebred German shepherd told him they let Victoria know that he wasn't going to change his ways just because she told him to. There's one other person I'd like to introduce you to in the book. Um, and Julia kind of touched on some of the ideas that she represents in this. And it goes to the idea of how this issue and the issues that it sends its fractures into um, are maybe a little bit more complex than we tend to be. Of all the neighbors, no one more clearly embodied the pressures that the local farmers were under to sign than Rosemary Greenwood. A warm and friendly woman, she had immediately invited me into her house when I showed up unannounced and made me a cup of coffee. She would have offered me something more substantial, like a homemade muffin, but she told me her oven had broken months before and she couldn't afford to replace it. There was no secret why she had signed on. Everybody knew it had been a rough couple of years for her. She had been widowed two years earlier. 
Even though her husband had smoked three packs of Pall Malls every day of his adult life as he struggled from before dawn to after dark to keep the farm his family attended for three generations from going under, it was ultimately colon cancer that killed him. Looking at Rosemary, it would have been hard to imagine that she could be from anywhere else. Though well into her sixties, and though the years of struggle had lined her face, she was still light in an almost girlish way, and in her barn boots and loose-fitting bargain store sweats, she seemed perfectly at home, scampering up the slippery ladder of a silo or tossing hay from a mow. But the truth was that, to Rosemary Greenwood, farming was a kind of indentured servitude. As one of her neighbors once put it, dairy farming is a lot like being in prison, except that in prison you don't have to get up twice a day and milk the guards. <laughs> Farming wasn't really in her blood. Rosemary had been born and bred down in the valley, down in the coal mining town of Taylor, south of Scranton, and probably never would have set foot on a farm if she hadn't been swept off her feet four decades earlier by a good-looking farm boy who had come down to a local dance in the valley. The next thing she knew, she was a bride. And the next thing she knew after that, she was cutting hay and milking cows and pitching insulage, chopped corn cobs and stalks from the top of a 50-foot silo. And then, in the fall of 2002, her husband started to weaken her. Rosemary had promised him on his deathbed that she would try to keep the farm going. That's what he had wanted. That's what her eldest son, Todd, wanted, too. And for a while, they were able to make a go of it. But within three years of her husband's death, things were starting to become desperate. That, too, was linked in no small part to the price of oil. In the spring of 2005, as a result of a complex federal pricing structure that had been in place since the Great Depression, Rosemary was getting about $11.40 for every 100 pound of milk, regardless of what it cost a consumer on the shelf. That worked out to about $1 per gallon of milk produced at a time when the national average cost of a gallon of milk was about $2.32. Back then, it cost her about $0.26 cents to produce that gallon of milk. But energy prices were spiking. So were Rosemary's cost. The cost of diesel fuel for the Ford tractor was going up. They were now spending a few hundred dollars a week just to keep it running. Nobody could afford to run a tractor for long at those prices, she told me. The cost of feed for their 72 head of Holsteins was going up too, and that was also linked to the cost of fuel, more than 60% of which was then imported into the United States. The federal government estimates that fuel accounts for about 40% of the cost of growing corn, and that does not take into account the hidden energy cost as more and more corn is diverted from the great national food machine to be used as the feedstock for the energy-intensive alchemy required to create ethanol and other biofuels. And it got to the point where grain alone cost Rosemary Murray and her son $3,500 every 12 days. And the price of seed corn was already starting its climb from $3 to $8 a bushel. It was only a matter of time. She knew until for the first time in her life she'd be in debt to the feed store. But what could she do? Energy costs were taking a 30% bite out of the farm's gross revenue, and that was just in terms of operating expenses. Like everybody else in America, she had to live. And living in a rural community like Dimmick meant that she had to drive long distances, sometimes 40 miles or more, to get to a shopping center or make a doctor's appointment. And that meant buying ever costlier gasoline to fill the tank of a gas-chugging SUV she needed just to navigate these back roads during the snowy northeastern Pennsylvania winters or to slog through the axle-deep Pennsylvania mud in spring. The narrow profit margins the farm had relied on had never been enough to put aside enough cash to adequately insulate the 150-year-old farmhouse she lived in, and it was now costing her $100 a month to buy the oil to heat the place. That, too was going up. Everybody else on the dairy farm food chain could factor all those costs into their price, and they did. While the price of a gallon of milk on American store shelves was fast approaching four bucks, farmers were still getting a dollar. And unlike the big corporate farmers who could use economies of scale to guarantee their profits, many, like Rosemary, were falling behind. 
Most of the other farmers on the road to Dimmick had seen the writing on the wall after the first fuel crisis, the Arab oil embargo of 1973, or after the second one, the Iranian hostage crisis in 1979, or the third one, the run-up to the first Gulf War in 1991, just like Cleo Teal, they had thrown in the towel. Some had retired, some had found other jobs, though those were getting harder to come by. See, as the farmers went under, at least in part because of the cost of fuel, so did the companies that relied on Local mills that for a hundred years had ground, had ground the corn that the farmers grew into grain had gone belly up. Local dairies that processed the milk had gone out of business too. There were other costs as well, costs that are harder to factor into the ledger books. These were the hidden price we pay to try to keep those foreign energy sources flowing, those intangible costs we don't speak of generally. When we draw a line between the price of a gallon of gas and the price of a gallon of milk, costs that are calculated not in dollars, but in lives. In places like Susquehanna County, when jobs get scarce, so do the young people who used to live there. Those who can leave do. And those young men and women who don't have the resources to move away have to find some other way to get by. In the spring of 2005, the local paper had run a story about how 59 young men and women from Susquehanna and two adjacent counties, all attached to the National Guard unit in nearby New Milford, had just shipped out to Iraq. A lot of people in Susquehanna County lingered a little longer over the news pages that day before turning to the coupons. So it was no surprise that when a West Virginian in the white pickup truck showed up at her place at the end of 2005, Rosemary was only too happy to invite him inside. To her, the $6,400 he was offering for a five-year lease on her 256 acres of land was a godsend. It wasn't a fortune. There probably wouldn't even be enough left over after she paid her property tax to settle the bill at the feed store, let alone replace the old electric stove in the kitchen. The oven had given up the ghost not long after her husband had, and ever since, Rosemary had been living on canned soup, hot dogs, and anything else she could heat up on the top burners. But it was enough money to keep them going for maybe another year. And if it turned out there really was gas down there, there could be a lot more money. You wouldn't even have to milk your cows anymore, the West Virginian told her. you just turn them out and let them go. She liked the sound of that. Rosemary inked her name at the bottom of the contract. I'm going to add a little bit to that story. Um, about the time the first well came through, which was the teal... There was a story in the local paper about how eight of those kids who had shipped over to Iraq were killed in a roadside bomb in Fallujah. Any of you folks know who Aubrey McClendon is? Ever hear of Aubrey McClendon? Aubrey McClendon, until not too terribly long ago, was the CEO, founder, CEO of Chesapeake Energy. He was also a big supporter of the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth. Those of you who may be too young to remember, okay, in the 2004 election, um, John Kerry, a decorated war hero, regardless of what you think about his politics, um, was attacked viciously uh, by an organization called the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, which was largely funded by guys like Aubrey and his pals from Oklahoma, with the idea of keeping George W. Bush, who had not served in the military during the Vietnam War, in office. And I happened to be talking to Mr. McClendon, and I mentioned those eight kids. And this is what Aubrey McClendon said to me, and this is a direct quote. He said, well, I'm not going to tell you that that was a war for oil, but I will tell you that if there wasn't oil, there wouldn't have been a war there. 
I talk a lot about my ambivalence about this. When people ask me if I'm for or against this, my answer is yes. I'm not dodging. I am as conflicted today as I was the day the landman first showed up. One of the things that I have that has kept me was the belief that this was, in addition to some of the environmental benefits that may accrue from this if this were correctly done, which are real. There are tremendous, tremendous risks, but there are also potential benefits. In addition to the economic benefits, which are unrealized at this point, and continue to be unrealized for the vast majority of people in this field, including, quite frankly, the people on whose land this drilling takes place. One of the benefits, I believe, or have been led to believe, was that it would significantly lessen our dependence on imported oil, which in fact it has begun to done to have done this process. What that hasn't produced yet, as we can see by what's going on today in Syria and Iraq, as we're sitting here, is any less exposure to those kids in Bradford, Susquehanna, Tioga, I'll try and maintain my optimism. That's what I've got. What do you guys got, folks? Let's talk, okay? Instead of having me stand up here and talk at you, you guys talk to me. Nothing? Can we clap? Oh. Observations? Insults? Yeah, what? I just have a question. If you're ambivalent on the issue, what's your goal by doing these speeches and writing these books? Do you want us to be ambivalent about it as well? Or no, I want a conversation. Look, I want, here, I have, here, one of the things I talk about, you know, big picture, this is not going to stop. This is not going to stop. We're not going to stop this, you know. Ban fracking now, it ain't going to happen. There's too much involved. All right. So the question is, can we force this to be done in a way? Can we force this to be done in a way that minimizes the, 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 the very real negative impacts, that maximizes in the short run the very real potential benefits of this, and then gets us the hell out of it in a very tight time frame. You know, the only way you get that conversation going is to get the beyond, get beyond the are you for it or against it discussion. Progress happens in the gray area. Right now, this conversation is so polarized. I often say this: you can't solve a problem, and we are facing some pretty serious problems. You can't solve a problem when you've got one side of the issue, for whatever reason, refusing to acknowledge that there is a problem, and the other side of the issue, equally ideologically committed to refusing to believe that there's a solution. You see what I'm saying? So that ambivalence, I, 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 as, as much as I hate to admit it, ambivalence may be the, may be, may be the only path through this forest. That, is that that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Nothing else? Come on, guys, I worked my tail off. What? <laughs> how, how optimistic are you for people moving from these very black and white positions towards more of a gray? Like, do you think that <coughs> there is any real hope for people, you know, on either side of this issue or a lot of issues kind of? There's a chapter in the new book called I Never Met a Liberal Before. And it's 
I sit down with a farmer out in um, southwestern Illinois. I mean, we are talking a guy, he literally says, I have never met a liberal before. And we sat down for four and a half hours, this guy and me. And this is largely what the new book is about. In fact, it's his farm that I'm referring to in the title. I mean, I talk to ranchers out in Texas, same thing. I talk to fishermen off the coast of New Jersey, uh, you know, off the coast of New Jersey, same thing. People all over the country, people who are not ideologically, politically, in some cases even religiously predisposed to believe in anthropogenic global climate change. And let's be frank, when we're talking about climate, we're talking about an issue that runs straight through that. And yet we are dealing with the consequences of it nonetheless. And I sit down with this farmer in his, in his tractor shed for four and a half hours. He has a few years older than me, not much. And we talked. And we talked about climate. And we talked about farming. But you know what? In that four and a half hours, we talked about same-sex marriage. We talked about gun rights. We talked about abortion. We talked about every single hot-button issue in this culture. Every single one of them. One old guy talking to another old guy. And you know what? About 85% of the time, we actually, about 85% of the time, we actually agree. About 10% of the time, we disagree. But I could see his point of view. And I could be in a position where I could turn around and find a way to make my values and his harmonize and he could do the same thing. About 5% of that, of our conversation, was areas where the gulf was just so big, we were never going to be able to bridge that. That would otherwise be irrelevant, except that in this culture, in this media environment, in this culture, the only thing we ever talk about is the 5%. And the people who talk about the 5% claim to represent him, they claim to represent me. My position is a lot more nuanced, and so is his. So yes, I remain optimistic, but only if we change the conversation. We have to change the, you got, how many of you guys are writers or want to be writers? This whole thing, this whole thing is about narrative. This whole thing is about who's telling the story and what's the story we're telling. What's the narrative arc of this? And here's the narrative we've been married to forever. I said this to Julia earlier today. There are an infinite number of numbers between zero and one, and every time we open our mouths, it's binary. I got a challenge for you. You want to make me more optimistic? Go out and write in the gray area. Write in the gray area, because that's where the story is. That's where the story needs to be told. Anything else? Come on, yeah. Oh, I'm going to get taken apart now. <laughs> uh, I've got a request and a, and a, and a question. Mm -hmm. Number one, for those who haven't read your book, uh, could you talk a little bit about our Penn State professor's discovery of the magnitude of the gas un underneath the Mar in the Marcellus Shale, sure. which surrounds us, sure. and also Penn State's role in urging him to promote the uh, knowledge of this? Yeah. And then my question is, have you discovered uh, any financial benefits that have come to Penn State from this research, either from energy companies or from grants to uh, Professor E, uh, or any any other financial uh, incentives for Penn State to want this to be publicized. I'll be honest with you. I haven't really looked at. I, I am not a big believer. Maybe we can get an answer. I, I think Harry's would, but no. <laughs> I'm not a big believer in the follow the money um, 
okay theory because I think money tends to have less influence on legitimate scientists than people. Will As John Stewart put it the other night, I thought uh, I thought it was a brilliant thing. Uh, he talked about 97% of climate scientists taking the position if the Koch brothers or anybody along the energy lines thought that they could change the narrative, they'd be, uh, I think, he, uh, making it rain in nerd town, I think. <laughs> I, and, and, and you know what? So I'm let, I also have, I also think that's also part of the idea of quote unquote, so I don't know, but I will tell you that I think overall the narrative of follow the money is kind of shop worn. It might have made sense in the 1970s, but the reality is the influence of money, I think, is much more much more confined now because there's so much money available from so many different sources, and quite frankly, there are so many other ways of getting prominent and getting fed. Now, Terry played a critical role in promoting this. I think for the reason that, one, I think he believed in his science, okay? but also I think because this was his opportunity